All right, so let's start. Welcome to my presentation. So today we'd like to talk about how we help one of the largest German automotive company um, to build a scalable cloud native architecture. So with the help of Cloud Foundry, and uh, of course, what the title says, uh, how it actually saved uh, human lives with this. Um, let me introduce myself first. So uh, my name is Dad Tren, and um, I'm a senior data scientist at Pivotal Labs. Um, I'm based in the Berlin office, and um, my job is actually to uh, help clients making um, full use of the data. And uh, if you would like to connect to me, so this is my Twitter handler. Um, let me start my presentation first with some facts that you may or know, may uh, that you may or may not know. Um, so, did you know that actually 1.2 million people die uh, in road crashes each year, um, with many people becoming more injured or disabled? And uh, basically, road traffic uh, crashes are actually a leading cause for uh, death globally for young people. And this is even before suicide and even HIV. And um, of course, if you compare it to other means of transportation, for example, like air travel or uh, trains, it is actually the most dangerous one amongst them. Um, so what is the problem, actually? Why so many people still die in, in cars? Well, one of the major uh, part of this problem is actually, as you can see on the slide, right? So worse road traffic conditions, for example, like class for us. Of course, there are other conditions, for example, after a huge rain, right? Uh, the streets getting wet and something like this. Um, nevertheless, um, in all those cases, people still tend to drive very fast. For example, I know myself when I drive in a car, so I was in Oktoberfest uh, this week and was driving like very fast, and despite the fact that sometimes the weather was not so good. And, um, and basically one of the reasons is um, there aren't very good smart warning uh, systems. Um, so from what we've seen, however, most traffic conditions are actually predictable somehow and preventable. So for example, we could use like weather data or data from other cars um, to warn drivers. For example, um, so I took the car from my, from my dad. He has a BMW. And the cool thing is they have this head-up display. I really, really like it. So you could just like integrate a system in this and then integrate it into the head-up display. And our goal was therefore actually to help this client to see if it is possible to predict road conditions uh, basically in, in, in Germany uh, based on weather data. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, in this talk, I actually, on the one hand, want to focus uh, on the technology side um, that we use to solve the client's problem. But um, from this slide, I mean, I know it's a very <laughs> uh, marketing synthesis, but um, from this slide, apart from the right technology, uh, the process um, that how to build a software is also a key component during, during our project. And we actually believe that you actually need the, uh, both components for a successful project. And um, therefore, I will also shortly talk about the process and also about the data science involved uh, during this project. So um, let's first start with the technology part. Um, when we started with this engagement, the client actually came to us and said, hey, I want you to solve our problem, but well, you know, we don't have the technology foundation uh, for this and possibly uh, possible for low money and please, I need it in 10 weeks because I have a board meeting. I need to show it to someone, you know? And I guess some of you probably would know it if you, for example, from a consultancy business. Um, so we were actually faced with a very I don't know, situation where we had no computing power, no software, so basically nothing where you can work on. For some people, that would probably be scary because like, oh, you don't have anything. But we were like, yes, finally. It's a super situation where we can actually build something on scratch and we can use anything that we want, right? So we can use the right technology for the right problem. And um, as you already can guess, we were using the cloud. So this cloud thing to build everything. And um, yeah, so basically this is how our architecture looks like um, for this project. Um, as you can see, this is um, the very famous um, Lamer architecture. Um, what we did here is 
Um, we were streaming data with Spring XD from cars and also weather data um, to two layers. So one goes to the batch layer, um, the other one goes to the real time layer. Um, and everything is, of course, uh, we did everything on AWS. Um, what we did here was we, on the batch layer, we were, streaming, we were streaming the data in a structured form. So basically the data wasn't structured. It was in a very weird format. We structured this uh, format through Spring XD, then we stored it on S3. And then from S3, what we did there is we spin up a Spark, um, uh, we spin up an EMR cluster with Spark, basically to um, pre-process the features to reduce the dimension of the data. And then what we did afterwards is we were spinning up a GPU cluster uh, on uh, Amazon and then using a uh, deep learning uh, network to train this model. Afterwards, what we did there, we stored um, this model on Redis. Um, Redis is, as you know, an emirate cache layer. What we did there, we stored the model there. We um, used the other stream, basically, and tapped it uh, onto Redis queue. And then this model was basically uh, doing just prediction with one of the services that we created, so the predictive API. And afterwards, um, we enriched this um, probability with more data, like GPS data, uh, data from the car. And at the end of the day, uh, what we did for this project is we plotted this uh, on, a, on a dashboard. So uh, as I said, we're using SpringSD. And uh, the reason why we're using SpringSD is because of the domain-specific language. So it was really, really easy to use this uh, for this engagement. Um, and also one of the main, actually, main reason is actually the shell script. So uh, as a data scientist, we're not very good at Java or some, uh, some of the other programming languages. So we are using a lot of uh, Python and, and, and shell. And um, basically sp in Spring, it was really, really easy to, to integrate it. it. And um, of course, it also had a very easy connection to S3, which helped us pretty a lot to store the data. Um, and of course, you have all the other advantages, right? So it's really easy to scale. Um, and um, in the future, we probably wouldn't use Spring XD anymore because uh, probably we would use Spring Cloud Dataflow. But at this time, when we, when we uh, started with this project, um, actually, Spring Cloud Dataflow was still too immature for this kind of uh, use case. So in the batch layer, as I said, um, we store the data in S3. And then, and then afterwards, um, we spin up an EMR cluster. Um, specifically, in this case, we were using uh, PySpark because we love Python <laughs> in the data science area. And um, afterwards, what we did there is, as I said, we spin up the, the GPU cluster. Uh, here, we, actually, we are using Keras. Keras, which is, which is basically a Python abstraction layer on top of Theano and TensorFlow. And um, then um, also in the, in, the, uh, in the next block, you can see that we were using Luigi, which is actually a project by Spotify to create uh, analytical pipelines. So in the real time layer, as we said, we're using Redis for storing and caching the model. And um, Basically, what, ha what happened, what I already described before, is the data um, which we got from SpringSD is queued into Redis. And then we created a couple of microservices, so like the predictive API, which basically constantly just, just give probability um, uh, uh, from the queue. And then afterwards, we're just outputting it uh, to the JSON file, enrich the data, and then at the end, um, creating a, a dashboard on top of this. And um, Everything basically ran on Cloud Foundry, so Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And the main advantage in this case for us was that we, we had different build packs, um, especially as a data scientist, as I said, we mainly use Python. But for example, for, for the other works like the dashboard, um, basically our software engineers from, from our team basically use JavaScript and Ruby to, to do this. And so basically the teams could focus on what they're good at. And of course, the other advantage is what you have with, with, with Cloud Foundry is of course, right? So it could be, you could easily scale at different instances, uh, have load balancing and all the stuff. So yeah. Um, the next important part I want to talk about is uh, actually the data science part, which was also a core uh, of this project. Uh, and um, the main goal was, act, as I already to mention again, was to predict uh, road conditions based on weather data. 
how have you, who have you know what deep learning and machine learning and all this stuff is or like? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I will give you a short introduction in, into deep learning because uh, I think it's a, a huge buzzword um, no, nowadays. <laughs> um, so as I said, our problem is to predict road conditions with weather data, and uh, this can be quite complex, especially if you think uh, about the data that you have, right? The input data, because the dimension is, is huge. It's because of three-dimension data, like you have a value uh, in each time step, right? So the time is also important, and also the location, because we're looking at uh, roads, right, uh, within Germany. And to, to solve such a problem, actually, deep learning is very good at doing this. And um, basically, what is, what is deep learning? So deep learning is actually um, a, a subclass of machine learning techniques, uh, which actually uses algorithm that mimics the human brain. Um, as I said, it's everywhere now in the press. So everyone is talking about this. I think uh, every startup that you're doing right now, every startup that's just started, that has an AI or machine learning or, or, or neural networks in the name, uh, is not going to succeed. And on this slide, what we're actually doing is, is um, we're predicting the moods of babies. So it's a multi-class problem. So you have three classes, which is uh, positive, uh, neutral, and negative. And um, here in this case, the, the input feature is images of babies. And um, what it does is, okay, we're in, in, uh, inserting it in the input layer. And then um, basically the network learns the edges, the contours um, of, the, of the faces, and then also the facial expression. So it, it comes, binds them together in the hidden layer. And um, the reason why this is called deep learning is because it has many hidden layers. So if you're just talking about one layer, so if you have one hidden layer, it's just a neural network. But if you're talking about deep learning, it means that you have uh, more than one layer. And um, Specifically for our problem, um, we don't. We all we have more than two layers, of course, because uh, uh, if you have only two layers, you you won't go too deep into layers and uh, learn le less of the complexity that you get from it. And also uh, concerning our problem, we don't have a multi-class problem, but everything that we did was kind of a binary class problem. So at the end of the day, in the input layer, for example, you either have uh, wet or not wet, or slippery or not slippery um, as a target variable. Concerning uh, neural networks, actually there are many types of uh, networks, but generally we can summarize it into two types of networks. So uh, you have feed-forward networks or you could have uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, in this case, a feed neural network is basically as we already saw before. So you're, you're actually inputting data into the input layer, right? And then um, the, the input layer goes one direction. So it can only go one direction. And basically, um, this neural network is very, very optimal for solving functional mapping problems. So functional mapping problems is actually, you can approximate any function that you like to. And um, typical architectures um, that we already, for example, saw before is like, it's called a multi-layer perceptron or um, CNNs. I think some of you might heard of CNNs, right? So convolutional neural networks. For example, Google is, is, is uh, there was a con contest from Google that we're using this kind of networks and it really performed quite well. And basically um, the feed for neural network is used in, in many, many applications. Um, whereas on the other side, we have the recurrent neural network. So the, the main difference between a recurrent neural network and a feed-forward network, feed neural network is that you have a feed, a feedback loop included. So, uh, so on the other, so for the feed-forward neural network, you can only go one direction. For the recurrent neural network, you can actually basically jump between two directions, right? So you can go in the past or in the future. So the network is learning uh, in terms of the whole time series structure. And that's why it's very good to basically model um, temporal, dynamic temporal behaviors. And um, also for this kind of network, you have many um, variations. So for example, you have uh, LSTM, so long short term memory. You have uh, GROs, so um, gated recurrent units. And then you have also have bidirectional recurrent networks. 
Um, the application, concerning application, it's, it's very successful and it's very, it's mostly used in handwritten and uh, speech recognition. I think uh, some of you are, a lot of you have like smart apps and there are many applications that basically use a recurrent network to um, give the smartness for this kind of application. Um, in terms of uh, recurrent neural networks, there are also many ways actually to construct the network, right? So, for example, you have uh, one to one, one to many, many to one. Um, in this talk, I will not go through deep uh, into all of them. So, if you want to know more, you just can Google this uh, this uh, blog post here by Andre Kapathy. He's he, he's doing his PhD in Stanford. Um, of course, I will also provide the um, and presentation afterwards, so um, you can look it up. And in our case, actually, the many to one is the most appropriate one. So basically, as you're already aware, we are dealing with weather data, right? So weather data has this time series component. So you have a sequences of values uh, over time uh, for each time step. And the output at the end of the day, what we had was um, either a wet or not wet, slippery or not slippery. So it was a one or zero decision, right? So it was a, a binary classification. And um, basically, this is this is resembles actually a very uh, famous toy machine learning problem, which is called the uh, sum problem. So, um, what are our key learnings from 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 this project? Um, as I said, we were actually trying to predict road conditions in Germany, and in terms of whether it rains or it snows, um, you know that in Germany it doesn't rain all the time, right? Or it doesn't snow all the time. So we're not like in London or somewhere else where, where you have 70% of your time, it's just uh, raining. So one of the problems that we faced, we had actually a very overbalanced problem. So overbalanced problem means that 80% uh, of the time it didn't rain at all, and you only have like 20% of, of the time it rained. And in terms of this, um, this is uh, actually a very difficult problem for a machine learning model, right? To 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 learn this in this kind of situation. But uh, of course, in this case, we 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 use, for example, different evaluation metrics. So, for example, instead of accuracy, we're using precision recall or uh, we use different um, machine learning um, techniques actually to, for example, either increase the unbalanced class, right, to make it a balance. Um, and um, yeah, and also, um, as I said, there are many variants for, for recurrent neural networks um, like ST, LSTM or GRUs. And um, for our case, we actually decided to go with simple RNNs because they gave us a better performance into, um, in terms of um, evaluation and also computational complexity. Um, moreover, also when we started with this project, actually we thought like, oh, the data set is still quite nice, so we can use CPU. <laughs> so uh, we thought like, okay, that, that's, that's still possible. But then after our first one, we were like, shit, that takes hours, so uh, not a good idea. So what we did is, okay, let's switch to GPU, and that was a really good decision, so uh, it was 10 times faster with GPUs. Um, a good good idea for this. Um, and also, um, uh, on this project, especially in, 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 in deep neural networks, um, you, you basically waste a lot of time basically just to find the optimal network. So there's actually no, no mathematic uh, foundation behind this to find the optimal network is basically art, right? So you need to experiment a lot. So for example, you need to experiment with the number of epochs, the the activation function that you're going to use, the the number of hidden layers, and how you actually construct uh, the the network. Of course, um, I mean in in in, in many um, university projects, you already have like pre-trained networks that you can use. Um, that's what we already did as well. But then also, of course, we need to ex um, experiment a lot actually to fit this network to our problem. And also one of the f uh, key points was that um, we actually need a lot of data actually to train the network. Sometimes we didn't have much uh, enough data so, for the, the, so that the network can converge because basically what the neural network does, it's optimizing weights uh, within a global f a network, right? And then certain looks for their uh, optimal global minimum. And uh, in some cases, um, it didn't converge at all. So, as I already said, apart from the right technology, uh, the right um, process also played a critical 
point in this project. Um, yes, I think some. I think every one of us who already attended the keynote uh, talk today with uh, Michael no, no, Michael no, Andreas Nolte and uh, and um, uh, Rob Me. So um, he actually pointed out. Uh, some of the practices that we have. So, for example, uh, pair programming. So, at Pivot Labs, we do a lot of pair programming, which means you have two people um, pairing, solving one problem. And also, we have test room development, which ensures basically that our code is always um, production ready. Um, in this talk, actually, I, I will not go through all of them into more detail, but only uh, on um, API first. So, yeah. So what is actually API first? This is actually an image that I um, took from Miko Brown's new post. So what is hardcore data science in practice? So he published it last week. So it was really good that he did last week for me. Um, basically what it is is API first is actually a thinking uh, to ensure that you uh, think about how to in interact between a data science part, so the data science model, uh, to the software engineers. So how do you basically um, make it production ready, right? Because um, I don't know if you uh, see it in your companies, right? So may, you might start a data science initiatives, you, you hire, might hire a data, science, a data science team and start a data science team, but uh, at the end of the day, Sometimes it's just going nowhere because they are doing a lot of R&D, right? Because uh, most data scientists don't have a software engineering background, so it's really hard for them. And basically what we are doing or we are trying to do is, okay, uh, let's pair data science with the software engineer, right? To think very early uh, how you could basically put this into production. And our core is at the end of the day, if you look at the box between the data science part and, and the engineering part is basically to create an API uh, which offers a very clean contract to the software engineers and other other people, I would say, to interact with the model, right? Uh, yeah, here are actually additional links um, if you want to know more about, um, yeah, API first idea. So um, this is one of the blog posts that was written by me and my colleague Alicia. Um, it was actually... Uh, released two months ago, so I was ahead of uh, Miko's <laughs> blog post. But the blog post from Miko is also pretty good, so it's a very good read. I would definitely check it out. And he's he's talking um, into other areas in more detail than me because I was giving an example, and he was using it more from a very team teamish point talking about this. Also, from if you attended today's talk a uh, keynote with. Um, Dr. Nolte, he actually also mentioned that at Allianz, um, they had this very old waterfall culture and actually they had to create uh, this uh, their own digital garage, right? And send people there instead of having them within the company to make sure that they don't get um, influenced by the line managers. And this basically was the case for our project as well. So when we actually started with this project, actually, so our client told us that when they signed the contract, their procurement, so their procurement department and legal team asked, hey guys, are you really, really sure you want to work with them? Because it says in the contract, you have to come to the Berlin, you, you have to go to the office and you have to work with them, right? That, that, was, that was a complete shock for them because usually well, when, you're, when you're a big company, right, you're just uh, hiring your suppliers and they say, hey, I pay you this kind of money, so you have to solve my problem, come to my place because this is, this is uh, how it is usually, right? And what we did is they came to us and basically at the end of the day, they basically built it together with us. So that was a complete new experience for them. Um, another important point that uh, was also mentioned today uh, at Allianz is usually the release cycle, it can take months or even years. And uh, what we did actually, we managed it to pull it off within seven weeks. So uh, the, 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 the release cycle was much shorter and basically at the end of the day, they could give feedback and they could actually test it, right? And um, another important point was um, basically um, what also was mentioned today, this monolith waterfall approach, um, which is very still in many German companies. And um, for our projects, of course, what we did is we separated it into different microservices. So, and that was a good decision because um, the data science team could actually focus on what they're good at because uh, we're not good at 
Java or, or Crane code or in Scala or something. Some of us might do this, but uh, for this short time of uh, um, a certain amount of time, it was really hard, right? And the software engineers, they're very good at creating dashboards in, 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 in JavaScript and Ruby and uh, all the other languages they use for this, right? So everyone could focus on what they're doing, right? Instead of like, hey, you have to learn this and within a certain time, and it's not even very good code what they're doing that afterwards. And then the, the, final adva the, the best advantage was we could actually develop and also deploy it independently at the end of the day. So, what are key uh, takeaways from 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 this project? So, our our takeaway is use an API first thinking. So, bring your model as fast as possible into production because clients can test it. So, your client could it's not even what we understand from uh, from a consultancy business, right? Because your client could be also an internal client, right? The other departments or something like this. So, release it. Get feedback, right? So we have a very user-centric approach. The user is in the center of our our application. Um, you will get very fast return investment from this because you 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 always deploy early. And um, of course, for this project, uh, we use Cloud Foundry, which basically enables us to um, reliably expose the models as an API, and um, which which is one of the main advantages when you try to to create a smart apps. Right, and um, of course, the main advantage, what I already told, uh, what I said, is um, basically teams could focus on what they're good at. Right, so you 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 don't actually force someone to to do something else that that he doesn't want to. Right. So yeah, so this was my presentation. Thank you for coming, and I'm open to questions. No questions? <laughs> Pardon? Can yeah, so, so basically I, I cannot go too much into detail, <laughs> but it's uh, car data and weather data. So the details are uh, confidential. <laughs> Cool. Thanks for being here. <laughs>